Did you know that Kurt Cobain was once a roadie for the Melvins, the band that played a big role in bringing Nirvana to life? He even auditioned to join their band and later started producing their album, but failed miserably in both. We fired him because he was too screwed up to finish working on the record. That is the truth. Okay, and Kurt, you, uh, you produced the Melvins' new album. What did it entail for you? A lot of sleeping on the couch, <laughs> waiting for them to write songs. <laughs> Before we dive into the drama between Nirvana and the Melvins, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Let's get started. In Little Aberdeen, Washington, there were two young guys who were going to meet. Kurt Cobain, a hyperactive kid with a passion for music, and Buzz Osborne, who started the Melvins. This band ended up being a huge deal, because it influenced bands like Nirvana, Soundgarden, Tool, Stone Temple Pilots, Mastodon, and many more. And guess what? Fate had it planned for Kurt and Buzz to cross paths. Growing up in rural Washington, Kurt was drawn to the Beatles and the Monkees, singing along to their records at a tender age of two. He'd toy around with his aunt's acoustic guitar and even wrote his first song at just three years old. Music was his escape, and according to his grandparents, he'd often beat on pots and pans, experimenting with sounds. At the age of 15, Kurt's mom remarried, but then his stepfather betrayed her, which made her very angry, so she took all of his guns, pistols, rifles, and threw them into the river. Kurt hired a kid to fish out a couple of the guns, sold them, and used the money to buy his very first guitar. Later in his teen years, he got into punk music. That's when he discovered a band called the Melvins from his hometown, Montesano. Their music clicked with him perfectly, as if he had finally found a musical tribe that spoke his language. He was blown away by their sludgy sound, which was characterized by slow, heavy riffs and hypnotic rhythms. Kurt was immediately hooked, and he spent hours listening to their records trying to absorb every note and every beat. He was fascinated by Buzz Osborne's guitar skills, which was very different from the top 40 radio station he despised. In his diary, Kurt wrote, They played faster than I ever imagined music could be played, and with more energy than my Iron Maiden records could provide. This was what I was looking for. Ah, punk rock. Kurt was also drawn to their ability to secure gigs in larger towns like Olympia, Tacoma, and Seattle. Through some local teens who were linked to the band, he started hanging out at the drummer Dale Crover's parents' house, where the Melvins rehearsed. He even began assisting the band and worked as a roadie for them in his teenage years. In his very first media interview, Kurt bragged about how he had seen hundreds of Melvins' practices and even drove their van on tour. At one time, Kurt had a shot at joining a band, but during the audition, he got too nervous and froze. Melvins played a big role in bringing Nirvana to life. Chris met Kurt Cobain through his brother Robert, and the two became friends mainly based on their shared taste in punk rock music and their love for the Melvins. There's also a letter from Buzz to Chris and his then-girlfriend Shelly saying, Cobain and Dale went up to his aunt's house and made a tape of some Kurt songs. I was pretty impressed. Some of his songs are real killer, despite the poor sound quality. It sounds good, but could have been better with a little more time. Nevertheless, it's still a great demo. I think he could have some kind of future in music if he keeps at it. And just like that, Buzz predicted Kurt's career. In fact, Kurt had an early band named Fecal Matter. It included Dale Crover, the drummer from Melvins, and later Buzz Osborne joined on bass. Later on, when Kurt teamed up with Chris, they brought along some Fecal Matter songs, which eventually became Nirvana songs. Chris said, Dale played on our first demo, and a couple of those songs ended up on the Bleach album, like Floyd the Barber and Paper Cuts. We jammed for about a week, put some songs together, and made this tape. If you listen carefully, you can clearly see Melvin's fingerprints all over Bleach, especially in songs like Stain and Blue, with their loud, chaotic vibe and wild rhythms. In Floyd the Barber and Mr. Mustache, 
The Melvin's mark is clear in the tempo, riffs, and song structures. This influence extends to songs like Sifting and Downer, where the Melvin's use of slow, heavy sections and atmospheric textures can be heard. This influence kept evolving throughout Nirvana's later albums and helped shape their own sound. So, which do you prefer? Nirvana's early stuff on Bleach, or their later work on Nevermind and In Utero? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. In 1992, Kurt talked to Rolling Stone about his top albums, giving fans a glimpse into his music influences. Those same favorites popped up in his journals published in 2002. His list was full of alternative rock greats like the Pixies, Sonic Youth, and Ram. But there was this one thing that stirred up some debate. No mention of the Melvins. This oversight raised eyebrows, considering the significant influence the Melvins had on Nirvana's early work. Some say Kurt wanted to distance himself from his underground beginnings, and by acknowledging the Melvins might compromise his new fame. Others think it was a statement. Kurt was asserting his independence from his former idols, Whatever the reason, skipping the Melvins shook things up between Kurt and Buzz Osborne. As Nirvana became more and more famous, Buzz started feeling more and more frustrated. He felt like he was being overshadowed by Kurt, who used to look up to him. Okay, let's go back to Melvins. What, what are uh, your influence? Uh, what influence you, you and uh, the music you play now? Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, Nirvana. Nirvana. Our biggest influence to play something that is good, as opposed to what they play, which is bad. Bad. Good. Good. Nirvana. Nirvana. Bad. Even though the Melvins were doing pretty well themselves, it didn't feel like enough compared to Nirvana's massive success. Buzz couldn't shake the feeling that Kurt had left behind their underground roots to chase after mainstream fame. Soon after his friend's death, Osborne began speaking about him in surprisingly harsh terms. He initially planned an album titled Kurt Cobain, but changed it. He felt Kurt had been a prick for dying and messing up the Melvins' plans. Okay, and Kurt, you uh, you produced the Melvins' new album. I produced a few songs. Okay. I think like six tracks. I guess you can call it producing. I really don't know what that term means. What, what, <laughs> what, what did it entail for you? A lot of sleeping on the couch, <laughs> waiting for them to write songs. <laughs> it worked out pretty good, though. I mean, I had a few kind of stupid ideas. Like we, I got a bunch of plywood and put it down on the floor for an ambience and used a lot of microphones, tried to steal some of Albini's techniques. And um, uh, what else did we do? We enclosed Buzz's cabinet into a box. Didn't make a bit of difference. In 1993, the head of A&R at Atlantic Records wanted Kurt Cobain to produce the Melvin's new album, Houdini. And Buzz thought it was an interesting idea at the time, given Cobain's fame. However, this collaboration would ultimately prove disastrous. I uh, did a bunch of sessions with Kurt Cobain as producer, but it got to the point where he was so uh, out of control that you fired him and you guys went your separate ways. True. Okay, true. 100% true. We fired him because he was too screwed up to finish working on the record. That is the truth. The sessions were plagued by delays, and the drama surrounding production would ultimately overshadow the music itself leaving a stain on the Melvins and Nirvana's relationship. So, did Buzz sabotage Cobain to protect the Melvins from being overshadowed by Nirvana? Some fans say yes. Others whisper about a deep-seated jealousy, with Buzz resenting Kurt's charisma and mainstream appeal. What would Kurt think of all this now? Looking back on the drama from the great beyond, would he regret the fallout with his musical heroes? Or was it an inevitable clash between two fiercely independent forces? Leave your thoughts in the description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. See you in the next video.